Hi everyone, so I'm Erica Scorti. It's great to be here tonight and see so many uh, faces in the audience. So um, my work generally engages with identity and what we could call the emergent phenomena, that's actually my dad's expression, but I think it's quite good, of the mediated always on life. Um, so some of the themes that come up a lot in my work are the commodification of personal experience, um, the tension between public and private, which for me is behind a lot of this because it's not just about capturing and what's captured, but who sees it and, uh, and how it's seen and how it's read. Um, and the charting of lived experience through the diary form, which again relates to the capture all theme, I think. And more generally, what is a self uh, in a networked situation? Where for me anyway, identity emerges as much through uh, the networks and infrastructures that we inhabit and are entangled within as from any um, sense of a coherent kind of interior essence, which is maybe relating to older conceptions of a self or uh, even a soul. So uh, I generally use autobiography uh, and let's say my, my personal self uh, as a starting point to explore the idea of a subject aware of herself as caught within a system of um, technological and social, because obviously the two are pretty much the same thing, representations and networks of value. So I'm particularly going to talk today about these kind of feedback loops of desire and behavior and then what's offered back to us um, that, are, that are created by living in, in the world that we do. And just want to kind of get the requisite algorithm quote in with um, just talking about the fact that obviously algorithms and any kind of instruments um, have got their own biases and so even though they shape us we kind of shape them back and that's at, that's kind of at the heart of a lot of the things that I'm interested in so um, it's following the observer effect in science which is the idea that you can't stand outside of the experiment and you can't use tools which do not um, inflect the experiment and the result of the measurement um, so you've got Matteo Pasquinelli saying Algorithms often influence the very field that they are supposed to measure, an example of a non-virtuous feedback loop, which I quite like the idea of a non-virtuous, I don't know what a virtuous feedback loop would be exactly, but also, as Karen Barrett says, that um, apparatuses and any forms of measurement, which includes al algorithms, are neither neutral probes of the natural world, nor structures that deterministically impose some particular outcome. So, basically saying that, uh, you know, Things that observe uh, and mediate and represent affect the thing which it is that they are observing, mediating, and representing. Um, so, I mean, I guess in, in general, in, in my work, I'm interested in, in working with that creatively. So, the piece, I don't know if you saw it the, the other night at the opening, where I used um, predictive text based on log, um, I'd logged into uh, Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, Evernote, and my contacts. And it's this uh, keyboard which basically reads all of that and predicts what you're most likely to say. So in that sense, it's kind of algorithmically determined, but at the same time, it's very much about uh, me doing it. So the, you know, there is a physical presence, and it's about my entanglement with these, uh, these predictive uh, systems. So but one of the things I'm really interested in, which I will come back to later, is also the, the sense of a self as being uh, inherently statistical, so based on statistics and composite. So the, um, the forecast, your prediction, the prediction is based on your past behavior, but not just your past behavior, your past behavior which has been passed and read into something. Um, and that's a kind of statistical thing. But it's also, um, it's also collective in some way. The way that I understand the, something statistical is where does it fit within a wider demographic? So it's not so much you, but where you fit into a wider spectrum and diverge from or converge with the kind of um, dominant uh, demographic that you're kind of supposed to, um, to, to fit into. So, yeah, so in a piece like this, just being aware of the way that um, algorithms work in ever closer kind of feedback loop so that it becomes, um, as Donna Haraway said, I was, I was actually going to keep this quote till the end, but that it's hard to tell um, who is made and who makes in the relation between human and machine. And that's something I come back to um, quite a lot. So um, another thing I want to talk about just before introducing this, which is uh, life in AdWords, is maybe a shift towards platforms and um, the interfaces and infrastructures with, in which we're 
kind of um, in which we're entangled rather than necessarily the content. And I think this is something which reflects a general interest in uh, workings of infrastructure, which we'll probably be talking about more tomorrow in, in relation to stacktivism. But um, just to say that I work a lot with uh, the idea of creating these data profiles. So maybe uh, in response to the question of how can the mediate itself avoid becoming a commercial profile, uh, maybe it's my work is more about well, what happens when you do inhabit that position of becoming a commercial profile. So yeah, using um, things like Facebook or Google to um, construct these data selves. So in Life in AdWords, it's a diary. It's my personal diary that I wrote every day for almost a year. Then I emailed it to my Gmail account and recorded the keywords that it came up with. So there was a little bit of manipulation on my behalf because sometimes I would send particular paragraphs. So it's not exactly just what the algorithm said. It's also um, you know, some of my editing. Um, and it was then shared with the network. So as you can see here, there it is on Facebook. And you know, it's quite personal as well and, and kind of exploring the sense of the personal and private um, divide. So it's literally how do the algorithms read our emails? Uh, more generally, how do they uh, predict what it is that we might want to uh, buy and do next? And I'm just going to play a little bit of this. Upset stomach nausea. Body language. Hilarious jokes. Your mama jokes. Travel distance. Air travel. Sound and light. Speed of blood. Trip to Geneva. English conversation. Stress and anxiety. Natural stress relief. Existence of God. Is God real? God. The existence of God. So probably a good place to end. So um, <laughs> I'm interested in that video. Um, it, it, it kind of shows like quite visibly in an embodied way the strain of effective labor and also the kind of constant stress and anxiety of being this like unwitting um, conduit of uh, profit generation for uh, things like Google and obviously the commodification of private uh, personal experience where everything from you know owning a cat to fitting out your house to having depression um, is an opportunity for a conversion so for uh, for you to go and buy something uh, essentially and um, you know and the reading of affect and emotion and how that generates profit but the, the thing that I really wanted to move on to is the idea of what happens when you work within these uh, systems. So maybe instead of misidentification or disidentification, I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of over-identification um, as, kind of, as a kind of strategy and as a, a proposal for ways of working within these uh, systems. Um, so. It's an idea I've been thinking about for a long time, and it's this one of masochistic humor. And I got this from uh, Deleuze's talking about Kafka, um, which is the way that he describes it, is the powerful use of submission and weakness to gain strength. So it's the performative uh, assumption of a submissive position in relation to dominant discourse, which makes that discourse apparent as a discourse and not natural. Uh, and the idea is that that kind of uh, exposes power in some way and makes it visible. And I think this is a strategy that you can see quite a lot in artists' work, and it's something I'm um, quite interested in general. And I th it's this idea of self-mockery having a kind of power to it. And I think you can see that maybe in that um, in Life in AdWords, there is a certain amount of self-mockery um, within it as well. But what does it mean? It means uh, playing to the to the letter of the law in order to. Um, expose its contingency and often its absurdity. And I've also seen, uh, recently read a book by um, Keller Easterling called Extra Statecraft, and she talks um, about uh, another literary example from uh, Milan Kundera's uh, book, The Joke, talking about compliant activism, which is carried out by some prisoners in order to uh, in order to kind of confront authority in a kind of submissive way. And she uses the words um, exaggerated compliance. Um, and says, pick, again, so this word, picking one's submissions rather than one's battles is an almost invisible, non-controversial means of gaining advantage in the field without drawing attention to a broader strategy. Um, 
so this is also in Judith Butler's reading of um, Hegel's master-slave uh, dialectic, um, where the slave has power um, because the, the, the master needs them. Um, and I kind of thought, was thinking, oh, maybe so are we the, the users as the slaves whom the master needs. I don't know if that's maybe pushing the metaphor uh, a bit too far. But in Life in AdWords, it's this idea of following, it, following the, the logic of Google to the letter of the law and portraying a female user who is kind of over-identified with the algori uh, algorithmic reading of her personal experience, so much so that she believes it to kind of be herself. And reading out these, these keywords are said as if they really are, you know, uh, spoken from... Uh, some kind of uh, true self, let's say. So the idea that the submission of the law makes visible the working of the law and the way that uh, Google sees us uh, as, let's say, data, as a commodity, and that personal experience uh, is basically a commodity, is something that can be made, that money can be uh, made out of. But also, um, I think, and this is another thing that's important to me, is that it shows the shortcomings of algorithms and of any type of measurement, which is... Um, that you know, human experience can't just be measured by a bunch of keywords or um, a bunch of statistics, hopefully. Um, so just to shift tack slightly um, to talk about uh, intimate data, which is kind of, uh, I mean, it comes in from, you know, when you look it up, there you go, you, get, you see what it links to. Um, what I've thought about of um, Kate Crawford talking about the, the surveillance anxiety that follows in the living with big data, and obviously in the wake of the NSA uh, revelations, the sense that we're constantly, con um, we're constantly creating streams of, uh, of data, even when not laboring technically, even when not at work. But um, it's not so much that we're creating data, but how is it read, who's reading it, what sorts of profiles are they being made into? And this surveillance anxiety, is, to me anyway, is like, is the thing of not knowing who's looking or what they see or what profiles are being made. So I got this, I became interested in this idea of rather than trying to hide from it, from the idea of being made into a profile and being seen in some way, what happens if you try to kind of expose yourself or try to, to see the data that you're creating? Um, and in some way, I saw this as related to this thing of like, how do we look to the algorithmic gaze and to the, uh, the algorithm's eye? Um, and in some, in some way, I see this kind of, it resonates in some way with uh, these kind of fun Facebook quizzes and all of these personality tests and ways of kind of statistically determining yourself, which all play on the desire to know the same thing, which is kind of, how do I look statistically? How do I look to the eye of some uh, tool, some objective uh, determiner of value that, uh, that we can all be read in the same way in some way by this, uh, by this, uh, instrument or algorithm and you know how do I fit into a particular demographic or not so uh, you know here you have these these again the kind of fun fluffy side of these things of like how is it that the that you're seen statistically you know which are your most liked posts uh, who have you interacted with the most um, and this is from the Wolfram Alpha you can see all of your Facebook data and uh, handy little pie charts and word clouds to see uh, how it is that you look on the outside let's say so I then employed um, this, what do they call themselves? Well, they're called SP Index, and they do um, online uh, profiles. And the, the idea is, is that it's something that HR departments and uh, potential employers can get of you to find out how you look online. So you have a visibility uh, landscape and where you, uh, where you are visible online. And even though uh, in my extended talks with this, uh, with this company, they tried to distance, them, them, distance themselves from the more sinister uses of this, let's say in racial profiling or in other such things. I mean, there's an obvious uh, correlation there. This idea that you could get a number, which actually I don't think I've got the slide of it here, where you get a kind of rating, you get your SP index rating as to how well you're managing your online profile. So it's this idea of kind of submitting oneself to the algorithmic gaze. Anyway, I started to collect lots of this intimate data. This is a social searcher, which tells you how you're doing. Obviously, wasn't doing very well on Facebook at that time. Um, and things like Amazon, again, looking at your history and your Amazon recommended. Again, this idea of a kind of statistical self. Um, and your YouTube suggested and past histories. And uh, I also collected... Uh, samples of all of my search terms and URL and what I wanted to do was to give this to somebody to get them to make a kind of 
to read a profile of me and represent it back in some way. So I employed a ghostwriter to write a, um, my memoir based only on my digital footprint, so all of this intimate data, uh, and obviously the uh, research that they did online, which obviously, as my work is very much online, included a lot of my past work or stuff that, some, that falls somewhere in between the two. So I'm just showing a slide here of a project called Winning, where I entered lots of um, prize competitions uh, in order to try and win, you know, stuff. In fact, I won some L'Oreal products and some uh, sunglasses, which I then sold. But um, so, so the, but the thing is, that in order to enter these competitions, you have to like stuff uh, and share stuff and tweet stuff on uh, on Facebook. And it was this idea of kind of ruining your value by liking loads of random crap that kind of would slightly put off the scent of who I am. Um, on Facebook. But anyway, the, a lot of the texts that are here actually ended up in the book, which is here. I'm not going to read from it right now, but there's two copies left in the, in the shop here. That's one of them. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to, in, in some way, it's a kind of like, it may be, uh, it's a way of co-opting back all of that value that's been created by just sharing all of this stuff, putting all of this stuff online, potentially making, you know, creating value for everything from Twitter to Facebook to whatever, uh, Gmail, uh, Google even, um, through participating. So maybe in some way it's kind of taking it back, but it's clearly uh, also in the tradition of celebrity uh, memoirs and autobiographies, and this was some of the research into the, uh, uh, into the female celebrities ones particularly, and looking at the colors and whatnot. Five minutes? Yes. I think I'm, I think I'm on track. Um, so yeah, it's, it's called The Outage, and um, that, its name plays on the idea of uh, the, the tell-all, the kind of being revealed in some way, and, um, but also it plays into the idea of the attention economy and the kind of oversharing as this kind of uh, strategy in order to, to gain visibility and to maintain it. Um, but also in the sense of celebrities as the kind of ultimate branded uh, human beings who, uh, particularly when young, youngish celebrities put out an autobiography, there's this sense that they have to cash in on their value and their currency while they've got it, because soon the public isn't going to care about them anymore. So there's that sense that the, the, the demise of their value as this kind of human commodity is, is kind of short-lived. Um, so yeah, so this idea of, a, of asking a complete stranger to take my data, um, both intimate and private, but also uh, public, and make it into something without my intervention. One of the things I was interested in was um, kind of this sense of reflecting, getting somebody to reflect back to you a self that you're not necessarily sure exactly how you kind of come across. Um, I wanted that to in some way resonate with the idea that we don't know or have control over um, what profiles are being made of us. So we may have control over, let's say, what we put out there. So you may say, oh, well, I'm not on Facebook. But the very fact of not being on Facebook is a fact that is absolutely used by, let's say, an online social profiling company because it probably means you're dodgy, essentially. I mean, that's, that's what they said to me. So it's that sense that we don't necessarily have control over the profiles that are being drawn of us. And I also really like this quote from Benjamin Bratton, that imagine who your search engine thinks you are. Lacan could only dream of it. Um, and, and in a way, so this is a, this is a picture uh, from the book, uh, there's also something, you know, kind of really narcissistic about this idea of getting a personal reading, like, um, and I was interested in this idea that, that maybe it's a real privilege to be read by a person, you know, uh, only really important, famous or dangerous people get read by people. Uh, everybody else just gets read by whatever the template is or whatever the, you know, the algorithm kind of, let, let's put it this way, only if you're outside of the norms in some way. Um, would you be important enough to be read by a person? Otherwise, you would be passed by um, software, by algorithms. Um, and also, oh, I think we're just about finishing up. Uh, just to say that there's, the, the book very much plays on the idea of uh, immaterial labor and work becoming life and life becoming work, because what's presented is pictures, so instead of my life, or like pictures of me as a little girl or something, there's uh, a picture of me from another piece of work which is online, and that becomes the, uh, uh, maybe go back to that. You know, so there's the data profiles uh, as from, taken from the other picture there, that from the uh, SP index profile. Those become the kind of illustrations of 
my, of my life. So I'm now going to, I was going to talk about, oh, well, quite a lot of things, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll go back to that. But um, yeah, I just wanted to end on the, the quote that I'd said before, but just to kind of ask, what, what does it mean to submit to these, to these systems? And how can like playfulness and, um, and this kind of maybe a type of subversive, submissive, masochistic humor uh, even be, be used to kind of to, to, to live within these machine, machine readings and entanglements without being fully kind of just like, oh God, that's it. We are just fully co-opted, so I'll leave it there. <laughs>